hopefully we can have a pretty good discussion. Yeah, feel free to ask questions. We want to make this interactive. We appreciate that. Um, I, I really want to, before we before I forget, I just want to say how much I've appreciated all the support you guys have uh, given us and and showed up um, when we do this every every month. Um, it's I think really been fun for us to do. I've learned a lot, and um, hopefully you're able to learn something too. Um, so it's it's been a really enjoyable process for us. All right, Jan, do you want to, can you share your screen? Uh, it says host disabled. Um, let's see. Uh, share screen, multiple push, push, push. How do I give you permission? Why, why don't you just share your case since it's, if you okay. can, it's all right. All right, are you able to see my screen here? No? No. Share screen. Yes, your screen's okay. great. And like Jan said, please put questions that you might have in the chat um, so we can go, go through them. Um, I'm gonna jump through here a little bit because I'm gonna go to kind of something a little more straightforward. So I'm gonna go through this case here. Um, this is a 72 year old female who is otherwise pretty healthy. Um, and uh, came in with a complaint of uh, left-sided ankle pain. Um, and really no me significant medical history. These are her x-rays here. Uh, and, you know, she's, <coughs> what do you think? I, these are my, my ankle x-rays that I got um, when she came in. They, she fortunately came in with some weight-bearing ankle films. But what do you think about her, her ankle, her arthritis pattern? Um, what are you thinking as you look at this case? Yeah, so I think, you know, when, I, when I'm looking at, you know, ankle ar arthritis, you know, a lot of the indications, I guess, for fusion versus replacement, you know, in an older patient, um, and I'm getting a little bit more aggressive in some younger patients, too, to do ankle replacements. I think it's just kind of like the pendulum is swinging one way than the other. Uh, we saw this with total shoulders and reverses. We're getting a little bit more I guess, comfortable doing it in, in younger patients so they can preserve motion. Um, my thing is looking at these x-rays, there's not a lot of deformity. The one concern that I would have um, here is the that how the talus is posteriorly uh, sublux. So if you look yeah. at the Taylor dome um, in reference, I don't know if you can point that out, Nick, um, with your pointer, where the Taylor dome is uh, in terms of the center of the tibia on the lateral view. So uh, if you can see that there. Concern that it's, it's sitting back a little bit more than what is normal. So here's the center on the tibia or on the talus. And then here's the center on the, on the tibia. You can see some posterior subluxation. And she's got, you know, she's got a little bit of a flat foot too. Uh, you know, a little bit of collapse in her arch. Um, <coughs> if I go to the other other views here, you can see. Oh crap! I have to figure out how to get this out off. There we go. Um, you can see that there's some valgus alignment of the heel. Now, do you get this view, Jan? Do you get a Saltzman on these? You know, I, I don't always, I, I clinically look at it. I mean, like, and, and it's, I do in a younger patient. Um, I also, I actually get the entire mechanical access. So I get their full length hip to ankle view. Um, but in this patient and, you know, in her seventies, I probably wouldn't be that concerned about her flat foot. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think I, I will say that a, somebody with a flat foot and ankle arthritis makes me a heck of a lot more nervous though than somebody with cavus feet. 
and ankle arthritis. I don't know about you, but the flat foot, I, I feel like I've gotten into some very challenging situations with the deltoid and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, so it, it makes me a little bit nervous anytime I see it. Um, for those of you who may not know, th th so this is a Saltzman view. What we're trying to do is line up an axial, um, we kind of get the idea of what the weight-bearing axis to the tibia is. And you can see here that the heel sits um, in a little bit of valgus, meaning that the, you know, it should, that line coming through the mechanical axis of the tibia should hit kind of right in the middle, the slightly, uh, you know, outside here of the, of the calcaneus. And here you can see it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit more medial. Um, so may or may not be a concern, but something to consider, I think. Um, what else are you getting on these patients, Jan? Yeah, like I said, I get a I get a hip to ankle view just to look at their mechanical axis to give me an idea if there's any deformity, um, you know, uh, you know, for more proximally. Obviously, a lot of these the ankle system that I use, and I think almost every ankle system on the uh, on the market has uh, patient specific instrumentation. So we're kind of accounting for some of that deformity, but I still like to know um, an alignment view uh, prior to surgery. Yeah. I like to get foot films too. I, I try to get bilateral weight bearing foot x-rays just so I can know what's going on in the foot. Again, maybe in this person, not as much of a concern, but um, you're getting good foot, foot x-rays as well. You can see she's also has some midfoot arthritis. And I think that's important when it comes to clinical decision-making on a fusion versus a replacement, particularly in somebody in this stage <laughs> category. Um, so we did, I did get a CT scan, uh, and this is a case in which I used uh, patient specific. I would say that most of the time I'm using patient specific implantation <coughs> or instrumentation, I should say, Jan, what do you, what are your, what's your go-to for a decision-making on, on ankle arthroplasty with uh, patient specific? Yeah, if I can use patient specific, I use it. It's kind of like using a tool. <clears throat> I mean, if you have the right tool, why not use it and utilize it? So I don't see a reason why someone shouldn't. I think we're all getting mostly CTs and the cost of it is, you know, becoming more negligible right now. And, you know, I, I just don't think an ankle replacement is, is as forgiving as, you know, I do total hips as well for trauma. And I think in a hip replacement, you, you just have a lot more, um, uh, you know, opportunities to make up some type of deficit, you know, increase the leg length or change the offset and so forth. You don't really have as many of those variables that you can easily change in terms of an ankle replacement. So you mentioned, you know, your experience with hip arthroplasty, and I know that you have a strong, you know, total knee background as well but what are some of the differences you'd say between ankle hip and knee yeah I, I think it's just you have a lot more options uh, the ankle is just not as forgiving and I think um you know there's a lot less bone stock I mean I mean just mm -hmm. let, let's look at the obvious right like the talus is a small bone and so is the end of the tibia the plafond and I, I think you know I I've I've fractured the tibia a couple times yeah putting in an ankle replacement um, and it's, I think it's harder to deal with versus, you know, like a total knee. Um, if you, you know, break a little piece of the bone off, you can, you know, rip, you know, utilize cement or something else, uh, to kind of make up for it. It's not a big deal. Um, uh, but I think it can become, if you're not as careful in the, uh, ankle, I think it's, a, it's a lot more, de I think detailed and biased, but I think it's a lot more detailed surgery than a total knee or total hip. Yeah. I think Hopefully the I don't makes... offend total knee and total hip surgeons, but no, you can offend them. Um, all right, perfect. The, uh, I, I think you know the foot makes it challenging because <laughs> you get all the foot deformity and the post traumatic changes. I think that makes it challenging. Uh, I think the soft tissue envelope makes it a little bit challenging uh, as well. What What about an ankle when you're going into an ankle arthroplasty? Because I'll be honest, when I get into one, I, I'm a little bit more, just a little bit more anxious than some other cases. Because I feel like I've I've got to be totally dialed in. What uh, for you? What makes you most nervous as you get into, as you're getting into an ankle arthroplasty? Yeah, so I think making the right alignment cut um, makes me the most, uh, I guess, anxious during the case. I mean, the approach is I do this approach for pilon fractures now. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I become much better at the <laughs> at the approach since I use it so much. Um, but this is where it's key when I have like you know my rep and basically partner in the room. Um, you know, there, we, we have the alignment guides and the you know the report from the uh, patient specific instrumentation. You know, ready. And we're examining it together and very critically analyzing the x-rays and fluoroscopy during the case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'll click, I'll click through this case here. There's a couple learning points, maybe or may or may not be related to ankle arthroplasty. You know, I, yeah, I if agree you stop you, right there, like, even just stopping right there, that, that yeah. image on the right, you know, like um, if anybody's familiar with this system, you have to get like a perfect circle in the middle, um, if you could show that right above the cutting guide. Yeah. And this is where like, not only I look at it, but with my, this is where like, you know, having an experienced x-ray tech and then also a experienced rep in the room, just to make sure you're not overlooking any of these details. Because if you, you know, play around with this in a lab or anything, and I really suggest that, you know, the reps to show, you know, have uh, the surgeons do a, you know, anatomy lab, a cadaver lab, and a course, and so forth with this, and any of the systems, if you even rotate this a few degrees, that changes significantly on the x-ray. It's yeah. pretty impressive. Yeah, I think just being so diligent on looking at the images, and then whatever the plan is going to be for you as you're, as you're coming through it, it really double check everything. I think this yeah. And, and you really don't have that on the hip and knee side, right? I mean, you know, some people use, I don't use Mako um, or anything like that, but I mean, even Mako is not this exact. I mean, may, you know, I think maybe the company likes uh, you to think they are, but I mean, this is like very exact. If you move this one or two degrees <laughs> internal or external, this guide changes significantly. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's different in the in the body as compared to the lab too. I think that's you know because you get the the skin um, around it pushes it. The approaches are always different. Things don't aren't quite as mobile as they are like sometimes in a cadaver, um, or and it's hard to reproduce this in a cadaver. But uh, it it's very futzy. Uh, so what what I'll do on this particular system, and and this is a little bit different because this is that cut through guide. But uh, you know, I'll put one pin in with like, <laughs> check my alignment. That's kind of what I like to do. It's a little harder to do it with this cut through guide because you don't necessarily see it uh, as well as you did kind of with that older, um, the previous model. But I'll put one pin in because if you put too many pins in and you're off just a little bit, then it can really throw you off the rest of the case. And it's hard to get back, to bounce back from that. So I'll, I'll put one of those pins in, check it, make sure it's good then come back and put the other one in, just bringing x-ray straight in, straight out. I don't, do you have any tips otherwise, Jan, on how to get that get that just right? Yeah, I do the same thing. I put one wire in first, and that's what, you know, um, I think is very helpful from the rep to kind of remind me sometimes, you know, not to, this is something where you don't want to skip a step. Um, so you put one wire in, you check it, you know, make sure that guide fits right. And then you put a second wire in. This is this is not something you know. Um, like when I I always tell my you know reps you know see see something say something uh, like the TSA does. So you know to just go slow and and just you know let the surgeon kind of go slow during this and check everything. And now you go into the lateral. If you go to the next slide, yeah, here's the lateral. And you know you just compare it to your other guy, your intraoperative guide. Uh, as well, I mean, your um, preoperative guide uh, to make sure that you're, you know, nothing's changed, nothing's looking funny uh, during all yeah. of this. Yeah, my pins are maybe a little bit long <laughs> on this case, but, um, you know, so this is the lateral view and you can see here I've made, I, on the image on the right, I've made some of my, my resection there uh, of that distal, of the distal tibia, and then uh, working on the resection of the talus. Jan, can I ask a question? And I, this has been plaguing me and my partner a little bit is deciding on where we want the Taylor position on the lateral view. And what I mean is how much flexion, plantar flexion do you want? Are you trying to get on this? Because I've had a few in which they end up a little bit um, where I take a little bit more talus than I might like on when I get that final x-ray. And it hasn't been an issue, but you know, I start thinking about range of motion. And really what I want is to get that dorsiflexion for them to be able to get, you know, Dorsiflexion, plantar flexion doesn't seem to be as big of an issue. 
And so in some respect, I almost want to get that a little bit, I think I'm going to say the word planner flex because it seems to give me a little bit more run out on the front, on the front end, and it saves a little bit of posterior talus. What, what do you think? Yeah, so I actually will take out another millimeter of the tibia to try to get more um, dorsiflexion. So you free up a little more space. Yeah, and then I take off, you know, then I, so I don't remove as much talus. Yeah. Um, so I take one more millimeter and it makes, for me, it makes a world of difference. I never thought yeah. a millimeter would change anything. Um, but one of my mentors suggested it. <laughs> and knock on wood, I've not had a problem with it yet. Okay. So when you have them do it, you um, you build in the plan to take an extra millimeter off of Correct. the tip, and then you add that millimeter to the tip to the talus. Correct, and then like um, you know, I, I think it, you you know it allows me also sometimes to put in a little bit larger poly. Like I you know I I, I try not to put the biggest poly. I end up putting usually the middle one, mm -hmm. not the smallest, but not the largest. Um, and, you know, but I've not had any problems taking a little bit more tibia. I think it just frees up the space so you can see better. And then, because I, I, for me, the talus cut is actually harder than the um, tibia cut. Um, and then what about rotation? That's one thing that's plagued me a little bit is deciding on rotation of the talus or maybe everything because you got has to be, everything's got to be moving together. And maybe those of you who've worked with the star, maybe that's an advantage because that's a uh, mobile bearing uh, 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 system. Um, but what do you think about rotation? Yeah, so I, I you know, I've, I move the ankle through a range of motion and see where the talus wants to sit. And then I mark it and that's where I put it, right? Because I, do a, when flat, you're doing I your, kind of do a flat plan. cut talus. How about when you do your plan? Uh, I have it, um, was it a little bit anterior, more anterior? Like I used to put it more posterior and now I moved it a, a little bit more anterior um, over the years. Okay, okay. Yeah, maybe um, a millimeter or so. See here if I can. So then this is after my, after my resection and I'm pretty happy. I, I probably would have used a long, I, I pretty much always, not always, but most of the time, I'm going to go with the longer uh, implant to maximize my anterior posterior coverage. Somebody that um, taught me that a couple of years ago. So that's my tendency, Jan. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. And, you know, there's a question here. Uh, Graham says, uh, how often are you doing a, a coupled pinning with uncoupled cuts during your uh, total ankles? Coupled pinning with uncoupled, coupled. Yeah, are you coupling the? Are you coupling the cut? Are you doing the cuts at the same time? Or are you doing them individually with the guides? This one I coupled. I will um, most of the time. However, I uncouple the cuts. How yeah, I've been doing the same thing. I don't know why. Um, you know, when I did my training, we used to just couple them many times, and, and it work, would work fine. And. <laughs> I don't know, like I, I get a little bit more maybe OCD doing total ankles and I just like like to do them separately now. Um, well, I, I, don't like yeah, I think, steps. you know, sometimes I've, I've had done some coupled um, cuts and then you know, things weren't completely balanced. I guess that would be one argument for it. And then your resection of your talus is off a little bit. Um, but uh, I, I would say most of the time I'm, I'm doing the same thing. Now, if you're using a frame, or, you know, in this with the with what they would refer to as the in bone with the frame, you're coupling your cuts. In that case, I have one of those to show if we get to it. Um, okay, so then you know I have this is kind of going you know skipping ahead a couple set steps here, but I use I like using the chamfered. I like that in this system that has a chamfered option. Um, I, I kind of like preserving as much talus as possible. Uh, you know, I think back, I did do a number of um, lateral approach ankles um, several years ago, and I've kind of gone away from it, but it's, you know, that was, I like that <laughs> minimal resection. Uh, and, and so when I do a, this particular uh, system, I try to use a chamfered cut if I can. Jan, are you using a, a more of a flat cut or are you using more of a chamfered cut or? 
Yeah, so I used to always use a chamfered cut. And then when the there's a lot of data that has come out that the flat cut has, I think, the same results. I don't think there's been a clinical difference. I think the flat cut for me is much easier and reproducible. Um, a chamfered cut seems, you know, I, I didn't have a problem with doing it. It just, there's more steps to it. And yeah. it, it just seemed like it wasn't worth it where like the flat cut just worked well. And, and you know, since there's no issues, I, I don't see the reason. I'm sure there is a biomechanic, you know, there's some reason for the chamfered cut, but um, clinically, at least it hasn't uh, shown uh you know, shown up yet. The um, so then you get into this question of uh, what do you do about you know additional procedures um, in in totals and and I have a pretty low threshold to add a medial slide and MDCO onto things, so I was pretty thought things looked pretty good here, but I felt like she was with her flat foot. I was a little bit nervous <laughs> about her um, uh, you know falling into valgus and and I probably get a little I've probably you know, colored by my worst experiences. Uh, what do you think of this axial alignment view? I don't know. You know, in this patient, I, I don't think it's that bad, uh, to tell you the truth. So, I mean, she's, you know, you know, obviously she's in a little bit of valgus, but I mean, I, I don't think it's, you know, horrible here. I I, I don't think I would do a uh, calcaneal osteotomy here. Well, I kind of wish you had been around for this case, to be honest. So um, I did do one, and this is kind of where I ended up. And, you know, I thought, okay, you know, looks pretty good. I used an MIS technique and felt pretty good about it. Um, and then I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Oh. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so this is, you know, maybe eight months later. And now you're thinking, well, these things usually heal because that's probably what I said is, oh, they always heal anyway, no big deal. And just as it goes to show you, you can have things that that go go wrong. So I took her, you know, to make a short story long, I ended up having to go back and take out the take out the broken hardware. Uh, you can get those out. This is using that uh, reverse threaded easy out, which you can actually use through that that hole to get these the tips of those screws out. And then went back and revised revised the osteotomy, and uh, so now she's at uh, a little over. Uh, I think she's a year and a half out now, and and overall doing pretty well. I just saw her the other day, so that's you know just kind of a case that you know I, I think learning for me that <coughs> you know what is good enough. Thinking through additional procedures, I kind of. I, I think looking back on it, I probably didn't need to do a, a calc osteotomy. Uh, but it is something to talk about. What procedures are you willing to do in association with the total ankle, John? For me, a limited hardware removal. I'm very uh, picky about what I'll do. Um, if, if it's like an extensive hardware removal from like a previous ankle fracture, usually I stage it. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise I stage everything. Yeah. I, I like I that approach. I, I would, I've, I've done it where I've taken out a bunch of hardware and then done the total ankle. And I agree with you, limited hardware removal. And then um, ideally you take everything out, biopsy it, make sure it's not infected. What about osteotomies, um, any fusions? Would you, do you do anything with it, with the total? No, no. I'm, I'm very conservative with it. I have not been as aggressive. I've seen what some people have done and I think it looks awesome. You know, some people will combine a sub -tailor fusion um, I've seen and, uh, you know, in a cotton and, you know, I just, I think there's just too many moving parts then uh, for, for me, at least uh, during that type of case. Yeah. The um, I, I like the, you know, being able to do uh, <laughs> calc or cotton, a sub tailor is I've just seen too much out there with ABN. I worry about the assault on the, on the talus. That might be a little bit chicken, but it, I, I would agree that that I think is a little bit too much or for my comfort. And that's, that's where I would say too, like for, you know, someone in the room or, you know, um, a rep who's talking to a surgeon who's doing this and think about doing other stuff. The one thing I would say, and I say this to the, you know, residents and fellows and so forth is, you know, you never regret, at least I have never really regretted staging something, Yeah. but I have regretted not staging. 
And yeah. what I mean by that is sometimes you're in, in the middle of the case and you're like, man, this will be easy. I'll take the hardware out and then do, you know, stage two right yep. away. And then all of a sudden there's broken hardware or something's missing and yep. it's a cluster. And you're like, <laughs> you, you do that, you do the easy part of the case, but it actually was very hard and it took you a long time. And now you have the real part of the case left. So yep. Um, sometimes it's better from a mental and physical and, and anxiety standpoint to stage these things. Yeah. What about, okay, let's talk a little bit about what you need for what you like to have for backup for a total. Yeah, so go back to the other view, go back to one of the views where you have the fluoroscopic view. When you're doing uh, like at the initial. Yeah. Stop. Okay. Oh, go back. All right. So like right here. So you know, I'm I'm really looking <clears throat> for like I'm very aggressive doing a percutaneous screw in the medial malleolus. Um, so that's why I always suggest that someone has like a, a small frag or mini frag set in the room. Um, you can have a fracture along the medial malleolus when you cut uh, the tibia uh, because you're really thinning out that segment there. Um, and so if you could point out that area, you know, yeah. uh, Nick. But like, I think that's, you know, it's just simple, simple to put a medial mal screw um, prophylactically. Um, and I, so if there's ever like a, a right question, I do it right away off the bat. Before I do anything else, I just put oh, a screw. So you do it before? Yeah, I would do it right now. Yeah. I would, I would not even, I wouldn't even do the approach. I would actually just put the screw in before I made my anterior ankle approach. What, um, and then do you have a patient in which you are more likely to do that in? So yes, they're, they tend to be smaller stature. So I've done it at mostly on females. Yeah. And the <laughs> age, like a older patient? Oh yeah, o older patient, older female patient, just their tibia tends to be smaller and yeah. weaker bone. And the last thing you want to do is have a medial malfracture. So then you'd run that up something like, uh, like this? Yes. And, and then um, you're just doing one, one screw? Yeah, I just do one screw and then I, then I move on to the ankle part. Um, and I, I haven't had a knock on wood, a issue uh, doing it right away, but I'm also basing it off my preoperative guide, right? You yeah. know, you have the, the report from whatever manufacturer that you're using. Yeah. You know where your guide's gonna be and where your implant and I just stay well medial to it and, <laughs> um not not had an issue with it yeah interesting yeah I, i'll use a medial mouse screw but i'll usually do it at the end when i get to the end of the case if i look at it and i think eh, it's a little bit thin the number that i've used is uh what 10 or 11 based off of uh, lundin's work and I, I thought that was maybe in star uh total ankle I'd, I'd have to look again and i don't know if it makes a difference based off of the type of uh implant that's there if one's more at risk versus the others that might be something that would be interesting to study but you know, having a low threshold to use it, I think is extremely reasonable. I haven't put one in that I've regretted. No. And the other thing what I do too is, or not I do, but uh, I've had to use, unfortunately, I've had a, like an anterior lateral fracture as well when in putting, uh, implanting the component. Yeah. And yeah. so if I had, a, I've sometimes had to use like a two, seven, uh, you basically like almost like a buttress plate on the tibia. So a mini frag plate. So I think that's something that you just got to have ready in the room. You know, if you're doing this at a surgery center, you know, they just got to have it. I mean, it's pretty common implants. You don't need anything special. You don't need any, um, and <laughs> excuse me, anatomic plates. Yeah. I've seen, uh, but that can be helpful. I've seen people use staples. I haven't used it, but put staples, you know, on like if split, if you get that kind of, uh, impaction as you impact, especially more of a stemmed implant, uh, but use uh, staples as well to reinforce. Um, yeah, I've never seen a staple used for that, but I, I guess, yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah, so those are the things that I would say to be available in the room is going to be a small frag, mini frag, uh, be ready to put a medial malleolus screw. And that, that's what can be really helpful from like the rep and so forth. If they notice something like that, maybe that I didn't see. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, they're, you know, they let me know, Hey, I, I brought, you know, the, the cannulated screws are in the room yeah. in case you want to put up a prophylactic screw or something. Yeah. It's, just, it's a nice, helpful reminder. Yep. Um, 
you know, so if you if, if you guys are out there, you know, uh, supporting these cases, you know, that that type of information is helpful. If you've seen it, you'd be like, you know, you can even say, oh, I've seen, you know, Dr. So and so he or she will often put a screw up when it's so thin like this. Is that your plan here too? Yeah, <laughs> to be polite, but uh, kind of a helpful hint. Uh, yes, I think, uh, you know, avoiding a medial malfracture when they happen, they uh, that you feel uh, absolutely terrible and uh, they're rare, but they're and they're not they're not fun. Um, OK, uh, let's go on. Let's uh, talk about a little different, a um, little different approach. Uh, 64 year old male, bigger, not huge, uh, but he's probably BMI of <coughs> 435. Uh, history of ankle pain times one year. He lives alone. He still works. Um, he's beginning increasingly painful. And then there's this questionable history of some alcohol use. Uh, maybe been managing the pain a little bit for, by himself. Um, real quick, Jan, you know, this kind of gave me a pause uh, to think about things like neuropathy. You know, you mostly think about diabetes, but when you're doing a workup of somebody with a pain, painful ankle and you're thinking about an arthroplasty, What's your what's your workup for somebody who may be concerned about some neuro, neuropathic changes? Yeah, great question. So uh, when we and when we talk about neuro, neuropathy, for those on the on the call, neuropathy means that there's something wrong with their sensation. Um, that you know they can still basically maybe feel their foot or ankle, but something it's just not normal. So they may have some numbness, they have some tingling, sometimes burning. It's and it, it, there's a wide spectrum. So. I really ask the patient here, I get very concerned with diabetics um, because in diabetics have a higher chance of neuropathy. And, and this guy with a history of questionable ethanol use or alcohol use, he would have it as well. Um, I, you know, I ask the patient, you know, I, I examine them myself and ask them if there's any question, I do get an EMG. Okay. Um, and, you know, whether if there's any red flag on exam or EMG, I do not offer them a total ankle. Yeah. Yeah, that's smart. I think, um, you know, you can do they talk about a Weinstein monofilament test right. in the clinic can be helpful. Um, I think that's what I did in this case. He, he seemed to be OK, but um, it's certainly something to at least take a take a step step back. Um, would you have a BMI limitation, Jan, for total? Yeah, so <laughs> I, don't have a, I don't have a strict limitation. Um, you know, my one of my buddies always says, like, when you see the patient, you know, if they're too large or not for a total ankle, like it isn't. And I, I kind of find that true because, you know, some people can have a higher BMI, but you, they're not, I would say they're not like, you know, really obese. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, I mean, if they're above 40, I'm not going to do it. But I mean, if, you know, you could sometimes see patients and they're, you know, by BMI standard, they're obese, but you meet them and you're like, no, this, this is just a big person. Yeah. Um, then yeah. I don't have a problem doing a total ankle. Yeah. Uh, but if they're obese and, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, with obesity comes other medical problems as well. Yeah. Yeah. So then it becomes more of a, you know, an issue with their comorbidities. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, all right. So this is his x-rays here. Uh, painful sides, the left side. It's kind of an interesting pattern, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and he's got, you know, for those of you, he's got some more valgus um, alignment, meaning that, you know, the, the medial side opens up a little bit more. So the foot goes into a little bit more valgus. And I thought this was interesting. I included this view. Um, this is a non-weight bearing x-ray and maybe, you know, six months prior to Clearly arthritis, clearly in some valgus, but it almost looks like it kind of corrects towards neutral um, in this case. You know, I usually get the foot x-rays and I get that Saltzman view to, to look at the, at the alignment. Um, and so, you know, as I kind of went through the plan with him, I, you know, he kind of checked out. So I offered him a total ankle. Um, Arthur, what, what, what did you think of the Saltzman view going back here? Yeah. You know, I thought it looked, I mean, 
because he corrected to neutral, I you know looked at that and I think I was as not as concerned that once I did his total, I would correct him to neutral and it would actually line up pretty well. All right. Uh, and sometimes you know what I you know what I've done and I think this is a good tip for whether the residents or even for some of the reps. If you ever get the X-rays, I'll make two copies of the same magnification and I'll cut out the ankle if in, in a deformity case. I'll actually cut out the ankle and then this is the poor man's uh, you know, 3D recon is is then I will actually correct it just to see where his where his heel sits. And I'll oftentimes do that with the saltsman so that I can see that when I correct his ankle with the arthroplasty, that I know hey, his his heel is going to sit in a better, better position. Agree. Um, so I think I probably did that in this case. I don't have those those pictures. So you know, his I did a prophecy. Uh, or, you know, patient-specific instrumentation for this gentleman as well. This was uncoupled, as you can see here. So you can see my, my uh, tibia and my talus uh, being placed separately. Um, and I'm skipping through as part of it is just uh, what images we had saved as I was going through my um, intramedullary reaming. I elected in this case to use a stemmed component because he was a little bit older uh, I knew he was going to be super active on it, and I have on those guys. I tend to use a stemmed, a stemmed implant. Now I'm going to steal this phrase, but Hodges calls this tall white man disease, and he always mentioned that he uses an in bone when he does, uh, or a stemmed component when he does does these cases. So when there's where's there's when there's deformity. And there's some alignment issues, uh, some malalignment. I'll go. I'm more likely to use a stem component. I, what, what's your What's your thought? Because I've talked to other people, talked to a surgeon in um, in Europe, in the UK, who said they very rarely use a stemmed component and are most of the time using the more low pro, lower profile uh, implant. Jan, what do you think? Yeah, I go back and forth. I think it would be interesting if we could put a stem easier than drilling a hole through the calcaneus and the talus like this, I think more people would do it. I, yeah. I think it, it, this is just, um, I don't know, like there's some morbidity associated with this. You know, you have, sometimes people have heel pain. Um, it's an extra step, right? It's, it's, it's not routine. I mean, for some people it could be routine, <laughs> but uh, many times it's not. And so, I think we'd be more aggressive with stems. I wonder, I wonder what the next, uh, in, you know, invention will be, or you know, um, improvement will be for total ankles. If we could do stems easier than doing it this way. Yeah, it's a, it is an extra step. It does take extra time, uh, and it's, it makes the case longer. That's for sure. There's more things that can go wrong, uh, more things that that become a little more futzy. I, I don't. I don't uh, argue with that at all. Um, uh, so the, you know, I'll I'll go through you know, and even here you can see I'm pretty posterior in the talus with my reaming. So they talk you know talk about trying to be more over the lateral process. Let's see if I can draw that here. Um, you know, more here in this area here. My foot's pretty anteriorly subluxed, so it it ended up a little bit more you know in the posterior aspect of the of the subtalar joint than I would like. Um, but as I kind of work through it here, um, you know, this is uh, putting in the implant. I'll, I'll flex the foot in order to get make sure everything's down in the back. And then after, after in, insertion of the real components, you can see, you know, I think the alignment actually looked pretty good in this case. And overall, pretty pleased with the way it looked. And here we are at six months, I believe, um, overall doing well. I was Pretty pleased the way the way this one turned out. I, I think, like I mentioned before, the valgus ankles scare me more than the varus ones because of what that deltoid can do. Um, and I I can think of a couple cases in which the deltoid <laughs> has been going really badly, um, and and I've had some had to learn from that. So that so these always give me a little bit nervous. How do you look at a valgus ankle, Jan, and know that your deltoid is going to be okay? I've heard people talk about ultrasound, getting MRIs. Are you doing any of that? No, I don't think there's a great way to do it. Um, I mean, I, I think any deformity gets me kind of more anxious. You know, it's easier to do when there's no deformity. 
or the ankle. Um, yeah. But you know, with these stem implants, I think I think you can get away with a little bit. You know, there's some give. I don't think it has to be perfect. Um, you know, because there's going to be constraint from the implant, and and it also depends on you know they're gonna. I think they scar in a little bit. <laughs> yeah. After this procedure as well. Yeah. Um. So, uh, you know, one question I do have is, are you cementing your components here? In, no, in this particular I did not. And I guess I, I did not cement in this component uh, with this particular patient. Uh, sometimes if there's bone loss, I will. Um, I guess maybe that's the question for you. Are you, are you doing that at all? Yeah. So I, I put a little bit of cement on, not a lot. Um, cause you know, that's how the, this implant in particular is not approved for cementless fixation, even though, I mean, I, I don't, I think most people are not cementing these around the yeah, country now. It seems like it. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about bone loss just a little bit when there is, um, when you have <laughs> cysts in the talus or cysts in the tibia and you, you think that there's, you're going to encounter those. I mean, you mentioned taking a little bit less off of the talus, which is probably more likely to see it in the talus in that case, because in the tibia, you probably resect it. What are you using to fill those? Are you doing anything? Or are you just putting the implant in? Um, is that bone graft? Is that uh, some sort of other biologic material? Yeah, so I use the bone graft from the tibial cut to fill in any cyst. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you know, I'm not, so I'm not that, unless it's a concern, um, and I have used cement before. So if, if that's where I think the PSI looking at that CT scan and examining where your cysts are going to be preoperatively can give you an idea if you're going to run into some problems with like a peg. Um, but <coughs> that's how I determine, you know, I, I'll just look, use local autograft and <coughs> like, excuse me, man, um, I feel like I'm smoking and I've never smoked a cigarette in my life uh, um, or not in a few years at least. But Michael, uh, Michael has a question here uh, for this patient. Are you concerned about the subtalar joint here? You know, it's a good, I was just going to respond to it. And, um, you know, it, it didn't seem to be symptomatic. It didn't bother him. Um, but it, you think the drill, do you think the drill helped that? No, I'm sure not. <laughs> I'm sure it did not. And, you know, to your point, and that's a good point, you know, kind of looking at it now, six months later, you're like, gosh, that thing doesn't look that great. Um, and I have to go back and look here and see if I can go back to his pre-ops and see, you know, how much of an effect, because it's a little hard to tell. I don't have the CT scan here um, to show. It probably wasn't normal beforehand, uh, and, and a lot of them aren't. But, uh, yeah, the subtalar joint is a concern down the road. Now, I will say it does one of those things that, again, when you have subtalar arthritis or midfoot arthritis or TN or whatever, you know, adjacent joint disease, that's where I think the total ankle has been so valuable in giving us another option in which we can um, can, can do a, a reconstruction, give them good pain relief um, with that, without loading those joints. Because if you do a fusion in isolation there, you're definitely going to be loading the subtalar joint in this guy. And I think you'd be looking at this and doing a TTC fusion uh, for him as opposed to just an, an ankle arthroplasty. Yeah, excellent point. And this is one where Michael, I'll, I'll like you talk to the patient and let them know that they have arthritis in both joints. Yep. And I sometimes do a diagnostic uh, injection to see which one may be bothering them more. Yep. And if it's pretty equal, uh, I actually start by doing a subtalar fusion first and then doing a total. Oh, really? Later. Oh, interesting. So I will actually do the ankle first and then because uh, and then do the subtalar later but that I, I makes sense because you're you're giving some more bone stock i suppose yeah i, I just think that it, it, for me it's just easier because then i don't have to worry about where i put my screws yeah um you, you know and but I, I mean you could do it either way i mean they especially what they've done i've seen um some cases where they've done the subtalar joint and then they'll do if they if someone's had you know whether they're valgus or varus They'll, they'll do a lat lateral or, or medial ligament reconstruction, uh, put a, some, a very thin cement spacer to yeah. even out the ankle joint and stage it for a few months yeah. and then come back and do the total ankle. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think there's multiple ways of doing it. Yeah, for sure. The, um, I, the deltoid, when the deltoid goes bad, again, going back to the, the valgus, 
it is so hard to bounce back from that. And, um, and I've seen some really beautiful reconstructions. I haven't maybe reproduced that myself personally, but um, I've seen some that look really pretty amazing. Um, I mean, we're kind of wrapping up here, Jan. I mean, I have, I guess there's maybe one other one I'm going to show just to kind of really to show the contrast here. I'm going to click through real quick, okay? Um, yeah, so this is a 54 year old gentleman who's healthy, become a friend over the years, um, but history of multiple ankle sprains, and these are his ankles right here. And so this this is a pretty bad varus deformity. You can see he has an old school staple from a lateral ligament reconstruction back, um, I think, at high school or college. His right was worse than his left. Uh, I mean, what are you? <laughs> this guy comes in, says he wants an ankle arthroplasty. How are you managing it? Man, um, so this is a reason why we do brostrums, right? When we say like someone can yeah. end up with bad arthritis later on in life. Uh, and this is, <laughs> um, go back to the other view. Yeah, so first of all, I, I had a question for you. Is this too young of a patient for you to do a total ankle? Well, he's in the talk, so no. <laughs> <laughs> I do you have an age cut off? No, I, I don't. I mean, I've gone younger and younger over time. I don't, I've gone younger than this. And I guess in mid 50s, mid to upper 50s, I wouldn't really, I get, I mean, I worry about a lot of things with the ankle arthroplasty, but I've definitely done it and it doesn't yeah. concern me as much. My son, I, I'm the same way. I've done it. My youngest is like a 40 year old. Yeah. But, <laughs> but um, yeah. So this is one where I think, I mean, if you know, obviously bad arthritis, there's going to be you know contracture of the soft tissue and so forth. Um, there's bone loss on the tibia. Yeah. A little bit. It looks like worn away. Yeah. I I mean, I would see that th for me, I I would need to look at the. Uh, actually the CT scan for the, for the yeah. cuts. Um, so I didn't, so I, I did, I went round and round on this. I'll be honest. I talked to multiple people yeah. and the best advice I got was to stage it and to do the hind foot first and to get his foot plantar. Um, so that's what I did. And I don't have his, all of the interoperative play by play, but I ended up taking him and doing, a, I actually exposed his ankle joint, kind of like, and I didn't put a spacer in like you talked about, but I released all his deltoids. So I get his ankle joint stable and neutral, and then I pinned it. And then what I did is I addressed the subtalar joint and oh, did a subtalar great. fusion and a cotton. And um, I was able to get him fairly well corrected without doing anything to the TN and the CC joint, which I was actually quite shocked. So this is where we're at. He still has got a ton of varus, um, but he's better. Yeah. Now I feel like I can go ahead and do a total on this gentleman. So this would have probably been, I don't know, four or five months later. I went back, took out the hardware. And then this is one in which I used the frame because I felt like the frame helped me correct his deformity because he was so rigid. So I, I used the frame in this in this particular case that, that not, I had PSI designed and made, but I ended up using the frame for the deformity correction. And kind of, I don't have it, it really well shown here and I maybe didn't do as good a job, but what I'll do in this case, and if those of you who haven't seen this big frame, it basically it's a way that you're still using this drill hole through the calcaneus and, and through, the, through the talus but the frame goes on and attaches to the foot and you can actually pivot it back and forth. So I'll get the drill up into the talus and then I'll use that kind of neutral to the talus and use the frame to pull that ankle straight. And then the other thing that you do that I'm doing here is I'm using a osteotome in the joint to try to correct the varus deformity. You can see on this AP in the lateral that I have that in there to try to jack that joint open because the way I think about this particular device is almost more like a uh, gap balancing technique in a total knee yeah. where you're coupling all your cuts together versus cut measured resection where you're taking, you know, the tibia and the talus separately. And, that, and that's also nice if it's a big deformity too, you can use even use a, a small laminar spreader. Yes. Help as well in the joint. Yep. 
Yeah, it kind of depends on what can fit into there. But yes, yeah. lamina spreader, osteotome, something in there to kind of, but you got to do all your releases first and you got to get it moving. Now, you might argue that here my releases weren't that great or that my deformity correction wasn't that great. I thought the heel alignment was, was reasonable. Um, and uh, here's my um, resections and, and the... Um, kind of the play-by-play -play with insertion of instrumentation. And then I guess I'm kind of jumping to the end here just to kind of move things along. But this was, I think, at six months, I did a pretty aggressive medial gutter, medial lateral gutter resection and um, his lateral, do I have a, and there's this, the thing that's cool is that's his foot, you know, whereas before he had so, that stacked metatarsals, yeah. but the whole thing kind of unswiveled with correction of his, of his subtalar joint and his, and his uh the rest of his foot that so, looks great that's a that's a very complex one. Oh, for sure yeah i mean that's a that's a multiple steps lots of discussion with the patient uh you have to be ready for both steps and and i think what i my biggest reflection on on these kinds of cases are when you go down the path of doing a staged approach where you're doing a triple or some form of of corrective osteotomies to the foot you're kind of like you, once you get in, you're all in, like take a flat <laughs> foot that you go to do a triple. You got to get that right. You're all in. Cause if your other option was to do a TTC fusion, which it's hard to get bounced back now and go to that. So if you're going to do a triple and, and try to correct the flat foot, you got to get it right. And I think that part can be so stressful. Yeah, no, I'm with you. And, and someone uh, mentioned Lane mentioned or asked the question, what is your limit of coronal plane <laughs> deformity for an ankle? I don't, I get, maybe it's kind of like BMI a little bit, you yeah. know, and, and I don't necessarily have a particular number. I think it's, it's more dependent on what I think I can get corrected, uh, you know, how flexible they are, how the patient health, it, health is, those kinds of things. So no, I'm, um, I'm the same way. Yeah. Well, I think that's pretty good for tonight, Jan. Anything else you want to add? No, the, the one thing that we didn't talk about, but just it, it take about 30 seconds. So sometimes if I can't get enough motion, like dorsiflexion, like you said, I'm very liberal doing a, a TAL on these patients. So releasing yeah. their, you know, do, doing a triple hemisection of their Achilles. Yeah. Are you doing a triple or a triple hemisection? Are you doing a gastroc or? or? Yeah, usually a triple. Um, I, I have sometimes done a gastroc, but I mean, I find it usually it's tighter just it's the Achilles that's tight, not the gastroc. Yeah. Um, so I don't do a strayer as, as often. And then I've, I've started spending a little more time through the joint, just making sure all the capsules released as well, you know, just, just to make sure, cause that can get tight back there too, when they have post-traumatic deformity. Um, so I think that, um, I think that's helpful. Uh, in your experience, or does the literature say, does the alignment medial lateral centered of the tibial stem component have a long-term negative effect? Uh, not, Jan, what do you... No, I think it's, it's based on the, on the joint. So I've seen sometimes them being a little bit more, you know, off-centered, I would say. And, and um, I'm not seeing an issue, because remember, you're doing this based on the, the coronal alignment of the limb not of just the distal tibia. So you got to look at the entire tibia at the same time. That's where that, that frame really comes in handy sometimes um, to, uh, you know, base your decision on the stem with that. Well, that's a good question here. Uh, parting question, what are your top three expectations of your rep when going into a total ankle procedure? What makes a good total ankle rep? Yeah, I'll give you the first one. If they know the plan, as well as me or better than me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they've maybe gone over the plan with me. I like when the rep, you know, because these cases are scheduled out in advance because, you know, they're elective and they have the PSI instrumentation. Uh, so when we go over the plan and just make sure like everybody's on the same page, it takes only a couple minutes. And then, you know, everybody knows, oh yeah, we're going to do a medial male screw or we're not, yeah. et cetera. Or oh, watch out for this cyst. And I feel like it's just like, you know, getting the game plan, you know, uh, like a, before, you know, before the, uh, the actual event. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think knowing that what other procedures you're going to be doing um, is, it, it, you know, especially if it's, you know, whether it's a hardware removal or you're going to do an osteotomy 
or you're going to put a prophylactic screw. Um, I, that, that's a big one for me. Um, I think having the back table up and ready to go, you know, kind of with a couple steps ahead. So, uh, you know, cause you kind of know pretty much what all the steps are going to be with the plan, whether it's sizing and, and whatnot, I, that to me, I think that's super helpful. So just having that, having the, the tech helpful, the unfortunate thing is, and it's even worse now because of, you know, staffing issues and whatever. But a lot of times, because they're not like a hip or knee, they're not as popular. You have a rep who has never done one before, never seen one before, and they're back there, you know, um, or not a rep, a, a scrub tech, sorry, um, you know, back there helping on the back table. And that makes it really tough. So you really need to stay on top of them. Uh, and, and the reps that, that can really do that, I think, help out quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, you know, get back to basketball yeah. and uh, may your brackets uh, be never busted. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us. I think that when I sent out a little poll, it seemed like insertional Achilles was uh, fairly popular. So we may try to do that next month. I'll send out a date once Jan and I figure out call schedule. Okay. All right. See you guys. Thanks again, everybody. You bet. Bye. Bye.